Good afternoon. Welcome back. Sean here. Mountains Garage. In the rainy state of Maine today, the snow is melting. The great melt is on. We might get one more freak snowstorm between now and mid-April, but maybe not. It's been a pretty mild winter, all in all. And I'm okay with that. No giant storms. Cleanup has been pretty easy. Awful lot of ice. I finally, there's a shady area right where I walk in and out of my house in front of my garage doors that's attached to the house. Never gets any sun. Gets icy every year. When you put sand on it, the sand will, during the day, melt into the ice and then over, overnight it freezes over again and the sand, you can see it, but it's not doing any good. But that's not why you're here. Hopefully you're here to join in on whatever I'm up to today. And I'm going to start off with a product comparison. This just happened because I ran out of this Harbor Freight brand glove, 9 mil. I think they even had thicker ones. When I bought them, I was suspect, but I was upset that these that I typically get at my local auto parts store had gone up to almost 30 bucks a box. Now, it's, they're still worth it at 30 bucks a box. I wear these for fabrication and all, everything in the shop. It feels funny at this point in my life to grab tools without wearing gloves. It sounds silly if you're not a glove wearer. Years and years and decades, I did not wear anything on my hands. I wish I did, but I didn't. And I'll suffer the consequences for the rest of my life. So I started wearing gloves 10 years ago, maybe. It's revolutionary, again. I don't, if I accidentally touch my hand with the grinder, believe it or not, this will save me from bleeding more often than not. So, the Harbor Freight 9mm is like wearing an inner tube. They've been awesome. I wear them over and over and over again. It takes quite a bit to get a hole in it, usually after I've washed my hands with brake clean five or six times, and I'll wear these for days on end. They're a little tough to get off and on, all these are extra large, so they all should be about the same size. Again, this is my first box of them. I will buy these again. That's my last one. I've got it half wore out. These are listed as 7 mil, and I was happily using these up until I bought the Harbor Freight ones. But price, I forget. These are probably $15, $16 a box. This is $30. I haven't been back to Harbor Freight in months, so... I was gifted this box of gloves. They don't give you a mill rating. I just took it out and put it in my little Harbor Freight magnetic holder that holds it up on my steel door of my chest over there. There's no mill rating and they are as thin as skin. These are gonna offer very little protection to any abuse from metal working, which it seems silly to wear these metal working, but I'll tell you, it's awesome. I bleed a lot less, but. I'll wear them for chemicals and stuff and hope for the best. Can't look a gift horse, as they say. So curious, I wanted to know where these are made. These are made in Thailand. And both of these are made in Malaysia. So that's that. That's my glove review. Today, I need to finish up the rear end work in the dark. Where I left it, after I put the wheels on the other day, my 64 Dodge Dot GT LS Turbo Power Glide 9 inch Ford project. <laughs> Sound like a commercial. I've got the rear end centered again after I put the new wheels in it. I found another block of wood that fits perfectly between the tire and the inner frame rail on both sides. I moved the rear end back and forth till the, the block of wood fit. I'm no more scientific than that. So side to side and then I marked it with a Sharpie right on the spring perch that I got a weld on. So I'll, I can put it back where it was if I knock it out of the skew. And the other thing I need to do is I'll probably title this video opinion angle because if I put working angle, nobody's going to get what I'm saying. Pinion angle is only half the equation. You have the drive shaft coming down, in my case, in the dots case, from the motor. If you have a tube chassis cow with a full link, it could very well be going uphill. In fact, it probably is if it sits right. But in this case, the dot, the drive shaft is coming downhill. The pinion's pointing downhill. Combined, that's your working angle. 
and I'm shooting for three, three and a half degrees, so under power, it straightens out, closer to zero. If this was a full length car, I'd set it one and a half, regardless of which direction I have. The working angle, not just the pinion, not just the drive shaft. The combination of the two. Now, I don't care what these numbers are, as long as I have three degrees difference in the downward direction in this case today. I hope that makes sense. I had to think about it for a minute, but yes, I'm going to let the car down on jack stands to get the rear end up to ride height. I'm just gonna let the front end go down on the ground. I don't care if the car was sitting like this. All that matters is the differences between the two parts, not if the car's level or not. So I'm just gonna put the rear end jack stands, let the suspension settle and get under there and measure, and then use a bottle jack or a floor jack to jack up on the pinion, because I believe it's got to come up a little bit. So I'm going to measure that and see what we have. All right, I'm down here under the car on jack stands. This is the drive shaft. It's three degrees down. The yoke is 1.3, so I have to add those together. So I'm down 4.3. And I've been studying what happens as the these super stock springs go up and down and have determined I want to be between four and four and a half total working angle down. So in the load and when the car separates, under you know, the lee spring's gonna go away from the body. I definitely am gonna need four or four and a half, so I'm gonna weld it right there. Call it good. I've been using the bottle jack and a block of wood to move it up and down. I started ahead to jack between the yoke and that metal plate with a pinion snub I used to hit. And I'm happy with my side by side, so I'm going to tack it and then put it up in the air. There was a drastic difference between hanging down on the lee springs and that ride height. Ultimately, I could simulate, you know, under power, under load, the spring separating and separating from the body and the pinion angle. Or the pinion climbing the ring gear, but research tells me this should be good. And I did end up having the car fairly level because it was easier to get underneath. So I tacked it while it was on jack stands, and then I lifted it up on the hoist, pulled the tires off, and I've tacked it here. So now I'm going to pull the U bolts that I'm not going to use. These are too long. These are nine inch, about seven inch. And uh, probably weld it in place, jack it up and paint it, and put it back together. I'll weld it up now, just jack it up with the jack and put a little paint on the affected area. It's the next day. The rear end's back on the pins. I just went ahead and put uh, flanged nylock nuts on the back of the lee spring on the shackles. So you can set just the right amount of tension on them. Then I'm going to put the U-bolts on. The Calvert part number is pretty simple. It's actually UR325X70. So the three and a quarter in the middle to clear my tube, seven inches long. The nines were too long. This has been items in the past on this channel where I've highlighted where it's the tiny details that bug me. I think you need to choose. And whatever you do, you got to own it. And go your own way if you cannot find information like I'm about to point out written anywhere. Even when, like, for instance, if you buy ARP hardware, one side of the washers has a conical portion and one doesn't. They don't tell you which way to put it, but instinctively, you should be able to tell. For me, I need to put the flat part against the calvert bracket and the round part's going to face the nut. The identification on the nut is going to face so I can always see it. So it's going to be down. This is going to go in the car like that. Doing it this way seems backwards to me or half and half. Now, does it matter? Probably not, but it's one of those things. If you're going to work on cars and do intricate stuff, engines and stuff like that, transmissions, it's all in the details. All bolted back in. Actually tightened up for good, pretty much. I'll have to retalk everything afterwards. Ran all these down so they still swivel, but they're locked. This is a much more pleasing length. 
they don't sell an eight inch that I could find. They have three and a quarter by seven or three and a quarter by nine. So this worked out perfect. This housing has 3.25 extra thick tubes. A typical nine inch Ford has a three inch tube. And it's, this car is obviously on leaf springs. So the support is way out here, helping to resist the housing wanting to tow in under a lot of stress. Now we're talking a power level I'm not gonna achieve. But if you're on slicks and you have your four link brackets way in here and you got all this tube out there for leverage, you're gonna tow the housing in eventually. It's gonna, as it grips, it's gonna keep towing in. So you would need a back brace. This rear end does not sport any kind of bracing. It's a strong housing. It goes all the way over to here. Some of the factory Ford ones were the small ones, which are good if you're gonna put four link brackets really close. But you gotta keep in mind, you gotta build for the traction and horsepower level. So in this case, this is a housing that was all done probably destined for a street rod. And in this car, it should be adequate. Much stronger than the eight and three quarter that would have probably lived to just fine in here. So hope you get my drift. And one last thing on housing modifications. I'm gonna fill the rear end for the 56 wagon, but it's not gonna be braced either. But I'll go over more things in detail there. But the last thing you do is put the housing end on where the axle attaches because all the welding you're gonna do on the housing is gonna move it around. So the last thing you do is put the jig in it and weld her up straight. In the beginning of the video, when I was talking about nitro gloves, I thought about it and the box of gloves that was given a gift to me, the thin ones, the super thin ones, I decided just to save those for engine assembly or something like that. So I put the Ravens in the magnetic holder, I should show it to you, but go to Hop Afraid, it's a, a receiver for the box that hangs on any metal surface, on your toolbox or whatever, that just holds a glove box open so you can just grab the gloves. It's pretty slick. So just measuring the pinion working angle, in this video, I went through seven gloves. These are the Ravens that I used to use and think were okay. I'm actually spoiled by the Hop Afraid nine millimeter gloves, and I think they have them even thicker, but nine was a just tough. I swear it's like wearing, wearing a couple inner tubes, and I'm gonna have to slide on down to Horror Freight and get some. The problem when you go in there, I'm gonna spend more money than I want to on you know tools that I think I need. Some of their tools are pretty decent these days. You gotta watch out. Uh, I know they've, hop, I don't wanna go off on a tangent about Hopper Freight, but they've made a lot of people mad getting rid of their coupons. They'll probably come back eventually, but. I somehow get on, uh, I get the letter that the CEO sends out about their company goals and, you know, they want to make better quality products here in America eventually. So another one you got to watch out for is Speedmaster or ProComp. Their goal by 2025, I just, I get their letters too. They just hired a new engineer that worked at AFR Cylinder Head and Elderbrock that by 2025, 85% of their products are gonna be made here in America. Here's a good example of a company that was a joke by having all this offshore stuff cheap. Now they're trying to do what we all should be doing. But anyway, I got my axles for the 56 wagon. They showed up the same day I brought the car home. In the ad in the Speedway garage sale last Sunday, it said missing hardware. And it looked like there was only one retainer uh, that goes that holds the axle into the tube. Now, I'm putting a disc brake kit on this rear end. I think the caliper, caliper bracket replaces this anyway, and there was only one, so I wasn't worried about it. I have some of these. Put this two in the bag. The entire bag of hardware, it has the vent, all the housing bolts, if you have a bare housing, the studs that hold the carrier in, there's a full set of those, all the T-bolts that go through here. And then in the bottom of the box was one bonus uh, housing stud. The seals are on one axle. It's the type that takes the inner seal in the weld-on housing end, so I have to make sure I have the correct 
housing end to take the seal. I have two sets. Hopefully one of them has the receiver for the seal because the bearing itself does not have an O-ring on it. So the seal does all the sealing, plus it's a sealed bearing. Either way, I'll make it work. So I hope you got something out of this video. And again, in a couple days, we're going to be doing something else. Between then and now and then, I'll probably remember three or four things I should have mentioned in this video, but that's just the way it goes. Have a great Sunday. It felt incomplete without showing you the magnetic box. Ha, ha, ha.